As a lot of you know that a couple weeks ago, I was planning on preaching on finances, and I, I just love that message, and I'm so anxious to um, preach on money because I know the results that happen when we come into sync with Father's principles about finances, but I just felt like on Valentine's Day, it might be a little inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about giving and tithing when uh, you're already up to debt in Valentine's gifts that you're giving to your fam for your your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just really didn't feel like the timing was good for me to launch a series on giving and finances on Valentine's Day. <laughs> It'd be different if it had been some other time in the week. But <laughs> And as I was um, praying about that whole topic, I just really felt like God just dropped that phrase of that scripture that the title of my message is, The Greatest of This is Love. And so this morning, I would like to preach on that topic, the greatest of these is love. And so you can turn your Bibles this morning to, first of all, Revelation chapter 3. And I have two different scriptures that we're going to turn to and look at. And so put a bookmark in Revelation chapter 3. Once you've found that, turn to... 1 Corinthians, and I see in my notes there's no one. It's the first one. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. John, can I have you turn these down one click? I feel like all the way through it, it would be appropriate for us to just say, God, change my heart. God, heal my eyes. Father, let me come into the presence of God so much so that my life would be radically changed. I don't know about you, but uh, I've, I'm 60 years old. I've been a Christian ever since I could remember. I, I was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a child. I don't remember not having that aspect of my life. And so in the, in the last, give me five years, 55 years, I've experienced some fer- pretty incredible dynamics, life-changing events, and yet I realize and know that I am in need of it again. I need more of his presence to change who I am. It's his presence that changes my heart. It's his presence, his word that changes my perspective so that I can see clearly. And so today, we need that to take place. And so it is so appropriate for us to say, God, would you heal my heart? Would you heal my eyes? Do a miracle this morning. Father, as we read these scriptures, I'm asking your Holy Spirit would just unlock the things that you have written for us. God, the things you purposed for us today. I think before the foundations of the earth was laid, he pre-planned that we would have today, his presence would come and share in our hearts the things that we need to hear. And so God, we invite you for that. The main scripture I want to look in in 1 Corinthians 13 is verse 13, but it just feels like you can't just grab one phrase out of there. So to give it some perspective, let's start with 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. <clears throat> Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now skip with me to verse 13. 
Now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. As a pastor, I've done a lot of weddings and I've been around a lot of weddings. And I just want to present to you that these words were not written so that they could be spoken at a wedding ceremony. Now, there's nothing wrong with that (laughs) because the principle of love is very much uh, um, in there at a wedding saying love doesn't keep a record of wrong, isn't easily provoked, love isn't, you know, doesn't get offended easily and, and things, all those are in there. But the truth of the matter is in the context of chapter 13, This, as it talks about love, if you have all these incredible things in your life um, at the very start, if you move in the gifts of the Spirit, if you do these spiritual things and don't have love, it's just a clanging symbol. I've never been a fan of symbols, especially if they went off right next to you. Now... um, In a trap set and in, in the right setting, but a, a, you know that, that noise that, that accompanies people ministering and moving without love is just, it's a grating noise. And so Paul is in chapter 12, 13, and 14, the whole context of this chapter and these words about love have to do with moving and operating in the gifts of the Spirit, ministering, and, and um, things along that line. Now, again, it is, it's a great wedding thing, but it wasn't written just for that. It was written for us to understand there's a different kind of love that you can come into. And so Paul was emphasizing the need for that kind of love to be the baseline for why we do whatever we do. Ministry or moving in any of the manifestation gifts of the Spirit has to flow from love. But, you know, when you've been around a while, you can flow out of experience. Or you can flow out of education. Or you can flow out of knowledge. Sometimes you can operate out of relationships. But the truth is, if I am not operating out of the baseline of love, it has the tendency to be grating against the nerves. Even good God things done without that love, just because religion, right? Who here knows what the Greek word is for the word love? Love, agape, is the word that is used here. And if you've been around very long, we we talk about this on a regular basis because it's so accurate. In our English version, the word love has um, different nuances, how it's used in a sentence maybe, but the Greek had uh, five or eight different different um, definitions for words of love. And there is an eros love, which is a sexual love. Phileo is a friendship love. And, and, And this one here is agape love. And if I understand right from my professor friend, Vernell Ingle says that um, this word agape was invented by the disciples to try and explain the kind of love that they were experienced that wasn't normal. It wasn't natural. And so when Paul was talking about the greatest of these is love, he was talking about a supernatural love that you can only experience when you've been in the presence of God. And what's so cool about that kind of love is it, when it gets on you, it just seeps into your bones, it seeps into your perspective, and then in turn, it starts to splash over onto other people. <laughs> and the things that once were annoying about you just become, oh, I remember it used to do that, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Because when you operate from that Father's love that invades your life, it changes who you are. It changes your perspective, but it changes who you are. 
And so Paul, as he was talking to this church at Corinth that was zealous for, for spiritual gifts, they, they loved to operate in the manifestation gifts and they had all these things going on. Their, their doctrine was pretty whacked. When, when you start looking at, at some of the things that Paul wrote, I'm just going, man, this was a church to just say, now just stop it all. Don't nobody do anything, <laughs> right? You guys are messing up the holy thing just just stop. But you know what's really incredible about chapter 12, 13, and 14? He doesn't say, I want you to just stop manifesting the presence of God in your life through these spiritual gifts. He says, no, just bring order to it. But the bottom line is it has to come from love. Right. So as a pastor, as a friend, as a minister, wherever I go, I have got to continually look at the baseline. Why is it that I do what I do? Because I like ruts. I really do. This is working. And why invent the wheels and someone else has done the hard work? But all of a sudden, God changes directions and I'm still in my rut. Because sometimes methods are what we tend to use. But God says, no, if you love me, you will follow me, right? And so this Greek word agape is what it's talking about. The greatest of these is love. In our world, all we need is love. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, anyway, what they were singing about and what God was talking about is totally different. And this morning, I want to stop just for a moment and ask God to bathe us in that agape love. Father, right now, I pray that every one of us right now would be so saturated in who you are. God, we are after a spiritual impartation into our lives. We don't want just a knowledge of you. We want that. But God, I'm asking this morning that we would be infused with a love that would repair, restore, provide, provide, equip God today all the way through the rest of this day that we would experience an agape of love for the greatest things that we can have in our life is that love. Years ago, my uh, children, we homeschooled our, our two kids. <clears throat> and um, we went through a, a, a phase or whatever where we were doing workshops and, and uh, we got together to dissect frogs with other um, family groups and things like that. Well, one of the things that we decided to do was to teach our kids about uh, quilting and uh, attached to our church is Kathy Rapp, who is a quilting expert. If you've never seen her quilts, she is an artist when it comes to quilts. And uh, so we went to Kathy to teach our kids how to do quilting. And one of the things that I can remember, that was a long time ago, um, but <laughs> she brought out these red lens glasses. And she said, I want you to take these glasses with you to the material store. Now, I have a knee-jerk reaction about material stores. <laughs> I, I don't want to go down this dirt road too far, but... My wife knows it's an act of love for me to go into a material store. Um, there's nothing to do in there. <laughs> One's like, what's the point? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> My perspective. <laughs> But when you put on these glasses, if you, if you can put your, your, your agitation aside, put on these red lensed glasses that were designed to change the color spectrum and go to a grayscale, you could see that different uh, um, colors complement each other. Where if you have the, the glasses off, you can put colors side by side and they look normal. Of course, that's different. I'm, I'm typical male. Almost anything looks good. I don't color about color coordinations for people that have that gifting, D. <laughs> you know, it's like... Um, Years ago, we had uh, uh, a young man attend in our church, and he said, you know, Pastor, you don't wear a brown belt and black shoes together. <laughs> Why not? It works. You know, it's, uh, some of that stuff just doesn't matter to me, but 
when you put on those glasses, you could see there were different hues to different colors, and using the quilting glasses that Kathy gave us, you could see colors that complement each other. And when you have a Kathy quilt in front of you, and you put on Kathy's glasses, you can see that they're all intermingled with an artistic bent that complements each other. Okay? Okay. And then years ago, when I first moved to Seeley Lake, one of the things that I got into and I just loved, and um, I've moved away from it in the last few years, but going salmon snagging is just fun. Um, In our Seeley Lake area, for those of you that may not be used to it or or have experienced it, in the fall of the year, just as it starts to get icy and cold, the salmon run in our lakes. They're they're, um, um, kokanee salmon, they're, they're... locked salmon, I can't think. Anyway, they don't go to the ocean or back. They're freshwater salmon. Landlocked salmon, thank you. And, and when they spawn, it's just this colorful... First time I saw it, I was in a canoe um, on Placid Lake <clears throat> And see these schools of salmon just swirling underneath you was fascinating. I was just, it was like being in this nature film. I was just, I, I still am moved by it. But as I got into salmon snagging in, in this area in Montana, they allow you to take a treble hook and throw it out in the water. And when the salmon go by, you can snag into them and bring them out of the water. And at that time, you were allowed 35, which was a five gallon bucket full type thing. And so when I got into this, someone said, well, well, if you want to do salmon snagging right, you need Polaroid glasses. And I'm going, what? You know, I, I, I was born on the poverty side of, of the tracks, and, and uh, sunglasses all by themselves was a novelty and or a luxury. To have Polaroid sunglasses, I always thought when you went to a, a sports store and they had that display of glasses there with this fish there saying, try our glasses, put these glasses on and you can see, I always thought it was a gimmick, you know, I, d- I just didn't believe it. But I said, okay, I went down to Walmart and got some cheap Polaroid glasses, and I went back salmon, salmon snagging, and what I found is the Polaroid glasses cut the glare from the sun or from the light that's there, and all of a sudden, things that were there, I could see them. It cuts the glare off the water so you can see into the water. I'm going, it's not a gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, um, after getting a, a fishing gear and whatever, what you need if you're going salmon snagging is Polaroid glasses because it lets you see where the fish are and where the snags are so that you don't get messed up all the time. And as I was thinking about this whole aspect, uh, um, God wants to give you and me special lenses to see life from his perspective. I was on my way to Missoula Friday, um, and I was listening to someone preach. I can't even remember whether it was a podcast off my phone or whatever, and they made this statement, God is wanting to give us new lenses to see life from. I'm going, oh, this is, this is going to be exactly what I want. And they went off totally in a different direction, but the Holy Spirit was dealing with my heart about love is the greatest of these. And the problem is we can't see life the way God does. We, uh, our human nature tends to have a glare on the surface where you can't see the reality of what's going on in the people around you. So often all we can see is the surface activity and action and the things that seem to be glaring with us doesn't bother God at all. Because he sees so deeper into the heart of people. God's saying, I want to give you spiritual lenses so that you can see truth. So you can be able to spot error. So you can see the the danger that is there. So you can see the jewels in people's lives. As you put on the lenses that God gives you, you begin to see how this person can complement this and how God is arranging people in your life. It's not a hodgepodge, oh, whatever, but God is orchestrating people to come into your life to bring out the best in you. And so God wants to give every one of us new lenses. So Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened 
you would give us the lenses of your Holy Spirit to see with spiritual eyes what we don't know and don't see. Every once in a while, an annoying ad pops up, eHarmony.com, and I, I'm... <laughs> eHarmony.com is, if you don't know, is a dating app, and um, hopefully none of the men know how to use it. Um, <clears throat> I think the majority of men in our room are, sin- are not single, but there are a couple, so um, um, it can be good. <laughs> eHarmony.com has a, I'm not advertising for them, but they, they have an algorithm that they say works for, uh, for you. You go in and you sign up this, this whole thing about who you are and your likes and whatever. And what they do is they take your bio of who you are and they mix it with other people so that they can introduce you with compatible people. And so that when you start dating, it's just like, oh, no problems. Well, the problem is there's a lot of people like me that when we started getting together, eHarmony.com wasn't around. (laughs) And for some people, they have a rocky relationship. And they think, well, if I had had eHarmony.com, I wouldn't have this problem because it's that person that God put in my life that's the problem. If I just had someone compatible with me, I, there would be no problems at all. But the problem is our society has bought into the concept and the idea that compatibility is finding someone else to fulfill your life. And the truth is, especially for those of you that have been married a while, like me, compatibility isn't something that they do. Compatibility is something that I learn as I adjust to who God has made me to be. As I become whole, the things that bother me about my spouse become irrelevant. Because God is working in me a newness because that agape love that gives me lenses to see what I can't see all of a sudden helps me to be compatible in the life that God's made me instead of chasing about, I just wish life was so different. Well, you know what? I need to change. And so husbands, I'm talking to you especially, draw a line on the floor and say, right here is the number one problem. Okay, now I'm going to have Heather Ann stand up and talk to the women. (laughs) Same thing. (laughs) When I when I do marriage counseling, I always almost always go to the illustration of a triangle. God's at the top of the triangle. Husband and wife are down at the bottom far ends. And as the husband and the wife begin to pursue God as their number one priority in life, the closer they get to God, natural happening is the closer they get to each other. And so when I begin to work on myself, when I get passionate about getting uh, to, uh, um, with God when I focus on him as a priority, one of the things that happens is compatibility isn't really that big of an issue because I find the thing that God has worked in my life, all of a sudden my per- per- perspective has changed because the love of the Father changes my vision to be true and accurate. When I stop working on myself at whatever age you do that, the problems that you have in your life become glaring and they become problems. And so whatever age you're at and however long you have been married, when I quit working on the things that annoy God, then those issues become something that, that are an irritant in the marriage. And I truly believe you can have issues in your life, but as long as you're working towards God, God works out something to where the relationship can still work and, and doesn't come to a stalemate because you're not focused on an issue, you're focused on who God is. So I need God lenses so that I can see myself I can see my spouse. 
I can see those other relationships that, that walk around us in, in view of God's perspective instead of saying, you know, the woman that you gave me, she's the problem. To draw a circle on the floor with God lenses when I see who he is. Isaiah chapter six, I just love that. When Isaiah had a vision of who God is, he said, woe is me. And when he repented, God sent an angel to cleanse him. And then he could clearly hear the voice of God saying, I'm looking for someone to serve me. And Isaiah's hand goes, I'll do that. When I see who God is, I see who I am. And when I see who I am, I can see it from God's perspective and God brings a healing to me and all of a sudden the people around me that used to be problem people now are assets to me because I can see the compliment in my life that God has brought them into a place to bring wholeness to me and not division. I can see the depth and the beauty in the things around me because I have... The greatest of these is love. I want to bring one more scripture in Revelation chapter 3. And for those of you like me that are thinking, I'm so glad Pastor Gary is preaching this message because there are people in this room that need to hear this. (laughs) (laughs) Revelation chapter 3, start with verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know the works that you are, uh, I, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I've been a Christian all my life. I, I go to church, I pay my tithes, I'm, I sing, I know how to, when to raise my hands, I know when to genuflex, I know when... Um, <laughs> that's a Catholic thing. Um, there's nothing wrong with me. I, it says, um, I am rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing. Do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Jesus counsels them to buy from him gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and the anointing your eyes with eye salve that you may be see, that you may see. As many as I love, <laughs> as many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten. Therefore, be zealous to repent. That scripture just rang this morning as I was studying my notes again. Who am I talking to this morning? Every eye closed, no one looking around. (laughs) God says, As many as I love, I speak a word to bring discipline or change into your life. Therefore, be zealous to repent. Remember the word repent. Dominant means to change the way you think. As you change the way you think, your actions follow. Then there's this next statement that is very familiar and famous. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my words and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I as also overcome and sat down with my heavenly father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. That verse there in 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I just want to remind you, that was not written to sinners, to people who didn't know God. That scripture was written to Christians who knew God. These were church people. They got their yearly tithing report and it looked good. 
They served in the choir. They were on the benevolence team. They, they were doing excellent. They were saying, God says, I know the works. You're doing some incredible things. But there was a heart problem that was going on. And Jesus said to these people who knew him, I'm standing at the door and knocking. And if you will open the door to me, I will come in and fellowship with you. I present to you this morning, Jesus is standing on our heart's door saying, and I want to come into your life and fellowship because there are things about you that need to be changed that can only take place as you have fellowship with me, as you bathe in my love, as that agape love flows over who I am. All of a sudden, life changes. And I just present to you, that scripture could be written to Faith Chapel as far as saying God wants to come into your life more than any other time today and fellowship with you and bring wholeness the people in this church thought they were doing very well but notice in verse 17 he said they were wretched miserable poor blind naked he said i want you to ask of me and i'm going to give you i salve they needed what god had that would only come from fellowship with his presence. Not a church service, not a sermon, not Bible reading. It was fellowship that came. And verse 18 says um, they need to have their eyes anointed uh, um, with eye salve so they can see. I think lukewarmness is uh, um, equivalent to apathy and lethargy. At one point, I was excited, but now when the fire alarm goes off, I'm just going, eh, let's just wait a minute to see if it's grandpa's cooking. <laughs> 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 and, and sometimes apathy and lethargy causes us to sit longer than we should, and we have to be goaded into action. Right. The Laodicean church had a sight problem, but they didn't know it. They said, we're good. We have revelation. We have scripture. We can teach and preach scripture. But Jesus said, you are blind. And you need of me to come and give you eye salve so that you can see. Now, we know he's not talking about physical sight, right? And just like when, when uh, um, God invited uh, um, Joshua to look at Nineveh and see... I've given you the city. It says the city of Nineveh was tight and shut up. And God said, see, I've given you the city. There was a whole element of vision that wasn't gained just by natural view. And so God is talking to us this morning, love is is the greatest because the love of God changes the lenses with which I view life at. Whether it's on Valentine's Day or Christmas or Easter or name your favorite time when there's family stress. <clears throat> they needed an I said that only come from the presence of God to cause them to be able to see when everything else looked normal. And I just present to you this morning, I feel like God is saying to us in this room and for those that are watching online, God wants to come into the room where you're at and anoint your eyes so that you can see. We need spiritual vision at a dark time to be able to see the landmines for where they're at, to be able to see the jewels that we thought were people that were mean, to be able to see the benefit of my spouse and my kids and my friends and my family. All of a sudden, I recognize from God's perspective, I'm not in a desert place. I'm in a place where the wells of water are gushing out of me to feed the people around me instead of whining about my circumstances the greatest of these of love causes me to be the answer for what Seely Lake needs the answer for my nation God has put me as a deliverer but with his eyes to see one last scripture Paul talks about the need for my eyes of understanding to be enlightened and I'd just like to close with that. 
Heather Ann, would you come to the keyboard and play that last song? Jesus is in this place. He's standing at the door of our heart and he's knocking and say, for whoever opens the door allows me to come in and fellowship with him. He's talking to longtime Christians who are in need of his presence again. His presence. He's here right now. He's all I ever needed. His presence supplies my every needs. Maybe you have need of healing. Maybe your relationships are strained. Maybe you have broken relationships. You think, I don't know if this can ever mend. Just give that to him. And as the presence of Jesus begins to fellowship with you, allow the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Father, right now, we pray that that would take place. God, I felt like you spoke to me last week that we need to have new lenses from you to see. To see in deep places that we thought were shallow. To see the dangers that are under the surface. To see the beauty that's under the surface. God, we need those quilting glasses to be able to look around us and see that you've orchestrated people in our lives that are a benefit to us and not a problem. Father, open our eyes that we would see you. Cause our understanding to come in line with your perspective and your perception. God, this morning we are in need of spiritual sight as you bathe us in the agape of love, the greatest of these abides forever. The love of the Father heals us. The love of the Father anoints us. The love of the Father equips us, restores us. And God, today, I pray that we would sense that agape love that changes everything. Father, today is we're in your presence. I want us to just take a moment to just kind of be silent in his presence allow him to interchange interact with you to restore your lenses speak Jesus over our families. We speak Jesus over our marriages. We speak Jesus over our children. We speak Jesus over our neighbors. We speak Jesus over our places that we go and work, interact with people who don't know you. We speak Jesus over our community, over our our state, and over our United States. Father, today I pray as we go home that that communion that we are experiencing here this morning wouldn't just be something that we do on Sunday morning, but God, I'm asking that with these new lenses, daily we would open our heart's door to the invitation of you coming in and fellowshipping and abiding as we come to the close of this time together I just speak to every life agape love wholeness salvation sozo bless your people this morning in Jesus name 
God bless you this morning. Have a great Valentine's Day.